Nephilim bloodlines of the Mediterranean, the Aryan king, the shining ones, the Amorites, Atlantis, and the giants, and much more. So stay tuned. We will be right back with the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening to all of you little Torah heads out there. I want you all to be prepared tonight to have more fun than watching Joe Biden at a spelling bee. And around here, we spell it L-I-V-E. And we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? From the Puritan Barn, we are live once again on another Saturday night. And this subject has got to be one of mine and David's favorites, these subjects. And so this is going to be a look into this a little bit different, deeper than maybe a lot of times we've looked into it before with different, I would say, same information, but uh, more detailed on the Mediterranean Nephilim, which are super interesting. Uh, once I dug into this subject and and I've been entranced with it for for months, so I'm, I'm super excited to present this to you guys tonight. Um, and I know... Hopefully you guys have been doing good. Let me know in the chat. How you been, David? I've been fantastic. It's been a great week. Uh, just awesomely blessed. And uh, it's a hopping and a popping at ground zero over yeah. on FOJC. Yes, it is. Very good, man. Well, guys, stay tuned because we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Mainstream companies put dangerous chemicals in their products that contribute to disease and disability. This is why it's so important that we take care in the products that we consume. The skin is the largest organ in your body and it is the covering to your temple. Our sponsor tonight is Sugar and Spice Soap Company. They create all natural and biblically clean soaps and beauty products. They even have a soap for Midnight Ride listeners. Use coupon code NYSTV to receive 10% off all your purchases. Link in the description. If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids six, eight, ten years old be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. All right, guys, we're back. If you saw anything you liked there, check out the links in the description below. We also want to give a shout out to trutherfit.com where you can get hats, clothes, and even my, my most favorite thing that we have is the Midnight Ride mugs. And you can get those for half off with hashtag Torhead. I can't believe I don't have one here to show you. I'm sitting here holding up my hand like like I have one, but I do have one. I have like three or four of them, but you guys the have to check them out. The real mugs are visible. They are visible. So anyways, uh, David, I know you guys have stuff going on over at FOJC. Let us in on a little bit of that. Well, tomorrow night on FOJC Sunday Night Live, we're going to be doing another Cities Lost in Time episode with Brian Reese and myself. It's going to be a little special. It's entitled Nineveh, City of the Solar Eclipse. 
it's going to be coming in with the bells and whistles and all the hot sauce. So that'll be there. Join us for that tomorrow night, Underground Church, FOJC, 7 p.m. Central. Very good. Make sure you guys check that stuff out. You guys have been popping out a lot of stuff lately. And, I'm, um, I man, I, I tell you, there's so much stuff out there that is going on that's interesting right now that we could have talked about tonight. Uh, but I didn't really want to add to all the fear, add to all of the information on top of that about the upcoming eclipse. Um, as always, I, I think our message for the last few years has been to repent, that our, our nation needs repentance. And now is no different than that time. It may seem more um, preeminent right now, but um, at the same time, it's been needed for a long time. And so uh, we just pray that everyone who is stuck in the ways of the world and uh, does know that something's coming that they humble themselves before God and do so. But uh, tonight I wanted to talk about a subject that I think it all ties in because ultimately if we don't understand the subtle differences and the subtle things about the ways of God and the ways of the evil one, then it's a likely scenario that it's well very possible that even the elect will be deceived. The Bible says that the elect would be deceived if possible. So tonight's uh, information is broad. It's a broad spectrum of things that we could narrow down uh, in so many directions with the Mediterranean kings, but these are the Nephilim Grail bloodlines. And so before I get started, David, is there anything else you'd like to say? I'd like to say I love this stuff. I love this stuff. I am just supernaturally drawn to the study of the ancient peoples and of the the ancient cultures, how they relate to the Bible. I love it. And I, you know, no brag, just back, turn the midnight ride. You're getting the best research that's out there. You know, no brag, just back. John is digging down here into uh, Star Trek and where people haven't gone before, connecting it with the Bible. So I love it, love it, love it. Very cool. So as you guys can remember, maybe a couple weeks ago, those of you that watched, um, I did an episode called The Father of Gilgamesh, the First Shaman King. And this is more about the Nephilim kings and the shaman kings of the Mesopotamian area. Uh, this is like the House of Uruk. And this was a super interesting show. It talked about some of their Nephilim rituals, some of the rituals that they did in order to invoke uh, the spirits of the ancient god kings inside of them so that they could continue their life force through chosen bloodlines. And um, so for this one, we're going to be talking about uh, these, how they migrated and how um, talk about the different ones of the Mediterranean and how they're all connected. So so this is a, these are a few just depictions of some of these Mediterranean kings. But um, by the time the last days of the third dynasty of Ur, which is the civilization we talked about before in Mesopotamia, uh, the immigrating Amorites had become such a dominating force that the kings constructed a 170-mile wall from the Tigris all the way to the Euphrates to hold them off. And uh, at one point, they took over um what they took over what is described as were taken over by what is described as a demonic horde they're called the gushians gushians and i'm going to uh, show a little bit about this in the steel that um is a part of the ugaritic text and uh they they were a very powerful nation but as powerful as they were they were really no match for the constant attacks by these hordes these chimeric uh, monster type hordes that the Bible talks about, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, uh, this is the victory steel, and in this uh, these books, there's several different translations. They all pretty much agree on these translations, but there's an interesting story in uh, the Utah. I'm going to pronounce these the best that I can. Utu Hingal victory still and now that word hingal from what i understand is associated with the word kangal uh where like the mongolians what they call their leaders as well and um this one talks about how enlil gives this king called uta hingal which is described as the king of the four quarters gives him power to overcome these hordes to kind of save um their country that they're in it's Super interesting. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from it um, right here. And so it says, The god Enlil said, As for the Gushans, 
the fanged serpent of the mountain who acted with violence against the gods, who carried off the kingship of the land of Sumer to the mountain land, who filled the land of Sumer with wickedness, who took away the wife from one who had a wife, and took away the child from one who had a child, who put wickedness and evil in the land of Sumer. He had seized both banks of the Tigris in the south and Sumer. He had blocked water from the fields in the north. He had closed off the roads and caused tall grass to grow up along the highways of the land. The envoys of the so the envoys of the Udahagal captured Tirigan along with his wife and children at Debrum. They put handcuffs and blindfolded them. And Yudah Hagal made him lie at the feet of the god Utu and place his foot on his neck. Gutuim, the fang serpent of the mountain. Uh, David, that symbolism of putting the foot on the head of this serpent, what it, does this all remind you of something when you hear this story? Is this, uh, does this ring any bells with you? Yeah, this goes back to Genesis chapter 315 and the prophecy of the Messiah one day crushing the head of the serpent. And another bell this rings, I remember you did the teaching from Second Baruch on all the black waters. Yeah. One of the black waters and one of the final ones was the releasing of the abominations of the Amorites. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is this is going to get real interesting. I, I forgot all about that, but I'm glad you mentioned that because the Amorites, I talk a lot about the Amorites in this, and um, this is going to get pretty interesting. Sorry, Dave, that speaker is going off there. All right. So to give you kind of an idea of what we're talking about at this time, uh, there's a story uh, in the time of Abraham. So Abraham would have been around to see um, a lot of these Nephilim civilizations. He was around at the time of Nimrod. And he wasn't that far off removed from Noah. And so he would have been around in these times. And there's this chronicled story of the battle of nine kings in Genesis 14. And um, the, the, I guess I'm going to pull up Genesis 14 here real quick. I got this. I got to have to pull this up. I thought I had a had my Bible with me, but I don't. Uh, David, do you have, you have your Bible with you? Yes, sir. All right. So there's the first verse of that. Um, it talks about the kings that are going to war there. Uh, and there, can you just mention their names in 14 verse 1? And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Shedlarama, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. So it's interesting. It mentions these kings, and they've kind of formed a league together. And uh, title, king of nations, the king of the Goyim, which, and we know in, by Genesis 10, the Goyim are like the Japhethites, the, the people of Jacob, Japheth. And then you have um, the Shinar, which would be the king of Babylon. A lot of people believe Amraphel refers to uh, possibly Nimrod or somebody associated with that. And then you have the Shadler Ramer guy. Um, and it goes on to say in 14, bef when they had a league with some people and then they went against them. And uh, down further in the chapter there, David, it talks about how on his way to battle these people, he fights these, uh, what only can be described as a demonic horde. And uh, can you get to that verse for me? Verse 5 says, In the fourteenth year came Shedleramer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims in Ashtoreth Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Shavah Kiriathim, and the Horites in Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. So, this is this is these are the creatures that are described here in this text. They are the Rephaim, the Zamzumim, Amims, and the Horites, and of course the Amorites are mentioned in this as well. And when you look up these creatures, they're super interesting. I, I went into quite a bit of detail with the Rephaim, and they all could kind of fall underneath the title of Rephaim. But according to all the available data that I could find about the Rephaim, this is including the Ugaritic texts, the Bible, there are what, there are what seem to be three classes of these types of Rephaim. And the first class is what they would call the divine class or the overseers of the sky that are 100% divine. They don't have any human blood in them whatsoever. And they're called lamas, interestingly enough. They're called lamas. And then you have the yudug, and I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but 
uh, they are two thirds divine and one third human, which would describe uh, like somebody like Gilgamesh. Uh, they're also mentioned as the Dedanu, which we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. And if you guys, um, some of you guys already know exactly what I'm talking about there. And then you have the Ugal who were one third divine and they were the ones who were over the, the abyss. So the Lamas were overseers of the sky. Yudug were the overseers of the never, netherworld. And then the leaders over the abyss. Now, David, I have a question for you. Uh, you've been studying a lot longer than me. Biblically and um, theologically, is there a difference between the netherworld and the abyss? And if so, what are those distinguishable differences? Well, the netherworld slash underworld slash solar hades is basically the describing the totality of the the heart of the earth and the abyss would be a specific place in that the abyss is one of the specific places in the heart of the earth the bible speaks of shoal there's two sides to shoal the one side of abraham's bosom the other the fiery side but yes it the the netherworld would just be a more expansive term for the totality of the the underworld I, th I thought so. It's pretty interesting because, you know, the way that they operate in these texts and the way they give, because there's certain poems, they're offering praises to them and different things. And, and the way they operate is super unique. Uh, one of the one of the things that I found that's unique, and then we'll talk more about it here in a minute, but the leader of these Rephaim groups was known as MLK, which is the, the term for king, kind of like in the Hebrew Malik. Well, also Moloch was this term for king, and uh, this is mentioned in the Ugar Ugaritic text, and he appears in these texts in the company of Bel and Anat, just like you see with like Osiris or, or Adad and Ishtar in the Canaanite. It's like the Canaanite version of Adad and Ishtar. It's pretty interesting, yeah. and uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute because I did kind of go into a little bit more look into that um, here, but you also have the Zamzumim, in, and that's the Ammonite name for the people, what the, they called the Rephaim. And in the Hebrew, it means a roving creature. So, I, David, I, you've talked about these things before. But, man, these are some monsters yeah. so far that they're yeah. going against right there in yeah. this time. Yeah, they sure are. Yeah. Uh, what it, what it, the Zimzum, Zimzum means, I believe, I believe, too, that they when they heard them, is these are the same tribe that when they heard them, it was almost like a frightening uh, buzzing noise. Yeah, and literally the etymology of the word Zamzumin means uh, those that buzz. And interestingly enough, in Marian apparitions and in a lot of UFO abduction uh, scenarios, this buzzing sound has been reported. Yeah. And uh, the um, also just a couple of fine points, the book of Jasher does confirm Amraphel is Nimrod. And in the, the place where it says they come from Ashtoreth Karnahim, that literally means Ashtoreth of the two horns, yeah. which identifies them. I hope I'm not getting No, man, go for it. I, 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 like, we'll, we'll expand on that in a minute. I like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but, and that identifies them as Lucifer worshipers, goddess worshipers, yeah. and the, the, Ain't the warlike peoples that have their helmet with the horns, and I apologize. But no, I not at all, man. I, I I want your input in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's it's super enlightening to see all this stuff the way it comes together. But I, I'll tell you another thing too about I guess another one of these uh, creatures, real quick, to kind of finish up the ones they're going against. We have the Amims, which literally means terrors. Um, and I don't know if you've done any more research on the Amims or not, David, but from what I can tell, it's just another name for one of these creepy looking, um, Nephilim. I don't know. Yeah. And were you going to talk about the Horims? Yeah. The Horites, the Horites. Yeah. Or yeah, the yeah, Horites. yeah, the yeah well, I don't want to get ahead of you there. No, yeah. They, uh, um, they, the Horites. They're very interesting. They are interesting. So this is the Horites and there's two definitions for the Horites. Um, but one of them has to do with relatives of Esau. Of course, Esau wasn't born yet at the time that this take place, but these are like cave dwellers. And David, yes, please expand yeah. on what you know about these cave dwellers, because I know you did a whole show where you talked about these creepy little things. Yeah, and that's what it means. And troglodyte 
They were troglodytes, little troll-like monsters that lived in caves. And yeah. this is just so confirming. And there's passages in the book of Job where we see these little creatures. And what we have here, we have kind of uh, eclectic soup of the fallen world here. We got little cave dwellers out of the heart of the earth. We've got all kinds of different kinds of uh, creatures. And in the book of Jubilees, don't hold me to it, but I think it's 531. They give a good breakdown of the different kind of the, the Nephilim. So, yeah, we've got a very interesting crew. And what we got here, you know, Nimrod's not the good guy. You yeah. know, we got a Nephilim war here going on. Yeah, it's it's amazing, man. And when I was looking at all of these different things and all these different texts that coincide with the same time in history, they all described them as demonic armies, just straight up demonic yeah. And think Lord of the Rings type demonic armies, like these armies were bred with all kinds of things like dwarves mixed with trolls and stuff, just kind of a yeah. mixture of these yeah. um, chimeric type creatures. Yeah, you yeah. were talking in your, uh, I think in this broadcast right here on, um, uh, you did, you showed at the beginning about the Gamadim and the towers, Yeah. the the little pygmy warriors here, we've got the Horites, and yeah. you can just see this, you know, it's like a scene out of a movie, these guys yeah. with their helmets, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's it's really, it's really big stuff, this could be called World War One here. Yeah, it really could, it's, it's amazing, I'm pretty much all the ring lore, all of the, even grail lore, these, because a lot of, as you can see here, a lot of these lineages claim to be the lineage of King David, claim to be the lineage of Jesus, and this all is part of grail lore, and, and just the more grotesque version of it, because it's the real version, right? We've been led to believe a fairy tale type version of these creatures because of Disney and, and groups like that. You see these creatures as being beautiful little fairies, but the reality of what they actually were is quite different. And um, so... Um, in Genesis chapter 15, um, God made his covenant with Abraham, and he told Abraham that his descendants would live in Egypt for 400 years, and he explained to them that Israel would return to Canaan when the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So he explained to them that you're going to live here, you're going to stay, your your people are going to be in Egypt, and we know the story, some of us know the story of Joseph, how as he was sold into slavery by his brothers, it, it worked out good because he became second in charge of Egypt, was able to save the entire family, the family came over and lived in Egypt, eventually they wore out their welcome, the new king didn't recognize uh, Joseph, didn't know Joseph, and they enslaved them, and then 400 years later we have this, uh, them being coming out, but it, it says that they had to wait until the iniquity of the Amorites was complete, which is really interesting to me because it raises a lot of questions uh, because, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, um, but I thought it was interesting. I'll just read this verse to you guys, and it says, and he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom thy shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in an old age. But in the fourteenth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it's interesting, 400 years, I've, I've noticed a cycle of 400 years and nations, their iniquity running full in 400 years, and that reminds me, you know, we're running on the 400 years of America being a nation. It's pretty um, profound, but for some reason, the Amorites, it seemed like at certain times, God did use the Amorites to do certain tasks for them. And uh, later on, as we'll talk about, you even see that um, God calls Israel um, the child of an Amorite, right? And so there's a lot, lot going on here with this. And so the next, uh, the next person we want to talk about, because one of the most... Um, famous kings of the Rephaim was Og of Bashan. So we're going to fast forward 400 years till the time where Moses takes the people of Israel away from Egypt. They are delivered. God delivered them, and Moses led them out into the wilderness. And then fast forward to a time where Joshua and Moses and all the armies are battling all kinds of Nephilim, and this is Og of Bashan. And so Og was an Amorite by birth. 
and he was the king of Bashan for 33 years. And you can read about him in Deuteronomy 3 and Amos chapter 2. And Bashan means serpent. Just the Ugaritic term is serpent or dragon. So this is Og of the dragon, Og of the land of the dragon. Og is the king of the Rephaim at this time. And um, he lived in Ashtaroth and Idre, according to Deuteronomy 1 and 4. And um, in the towns, we see this clear representation of the gods that the king of the Rephaim sacrificed to. And the names of the gods, once again, are MLK being one of them and Rapiu being the other. And um, I'm going to read from a book called the... Let me pull it up here for you guys. It's called The Nephilim and the Unholy Brood. And I'm reading from page 72 to 73 here, and part of 72 and part of 73, because um, for those of you who don't know, William McLeod is a... A researcher, PhD. He's got a lot. He's got a such pretty good information out here. I, I believe I've read his first two books, and I would say that uh, he has a really good grasp. It wouldn't be a bad buy if you bought it. You would enjoy it. I think if you're into the kind of stuff. If if you're a nerd like me, you might enjoy it. Okay. If not, I, I'm breaking it down here a little bit. So uh, we're gonna go to page 72 and 73, and I don't have my copy of the book, so I'm gonna have to try to remember where I marked here. Um. It says, let us consider the two names, MLK and Rapiu, appearing together in aforementioned Ugaritic texts more carefully. Like the names Ashtaroth and Idre mentioned previously, a biblical passage exists where MLK and Rapiu appear together, namely in the Septuagint version of the passage of the book of Amos. This passage recalls the gods worshipped by the rebellious Israelites in the Sinai desert after Exodus. You took up a tent of Moloch, the star of the god Rephan. In this passage, the king god, as I will call him from now on, MLK, is called Moloch, a name clearly derived from MLK. The two names should be taken as parallelisms, referring to the same god under two different names, the same as we have discovered in the said Ugaritic text. And he goes on to say, uh, we could also identify MLK with Melkart of Tyre, with Melkart being from another form of the same name, like Moloch, the name Melkart was formed by the root MLK in the same way the cult Moloch was infamous for sacrificially burning children for this god, so was the cult of Mel Melkart. And Melkart was remembered in Greek traditions as Merlicertes, also called Pelimon, meaning children killer. And um, this is what his view is. He says, um, he also goes on to talk about the Cayune and his the, the relationship with that and the Phoenicians and being the same thing. And then he says, in his view, Sopdu, as well as Osiris, in whom the Sargon mythology became manifest to some extent, is simply the Egyptian version of the defied Akkadian emperor elsewhere called Santa Sandan, Rapu, MLK, Melkart, and Moloch. So he connects this god Moloch with all of these gods. And an interesting man, Moloch is one of these entities that through almost every text that I saw, David, and I'd like your input on this, but it is a king that they have elevated to the status of God because this king believes that he has imparted the spirit of one of these ancient kings inside of him so not only do we have Og as being a giant but we also have him taking on spirits it seems like in order to be the king of these um entities what what do you think about that and also is do you have any uh, other thoughts on this because we talked about the hero scamels ritual in the last show i did where you would have the priestess and the priest they would do rituals on certain days when the constellations aligned in order for this baby to be born of Nephilim stock. So in relation to all that, what do you think? Well, the Rapu, um, I remember, I can't remember which one it was, but we were reading from the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament about the Ugaritic text of the Rapu, and they actually believed that there were certain feast days were the and they're just basically this is just a, an abbreviated form of Rephaim, 
and they believed that they could actually summon these entities up and they would join them in their feast. And we studied about the Oberim, those yeah. is translated passengers in Ezekiel uh, chapter 38. And this is the, the idea of crossing over from one side to another. And what we have here, as Mr. McLeod mentioned, the, the worship of these in Israel, this began the worship of the dead, the worship of the cult of the dead, which is so pervasive even to this day. Yeah. And that's what we'll see the groundwork being laid here for, which unfortunately took great root within Israel. Yeah, yeah, it really did. Um, Furthering more about King Og, he, um, according to Deuteronomy 3, 4, he had, I'm going to pull this up here so you guys can see this. It says, and we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took, not from them, three square cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og of Bashan. And so he reigned over 60 cities in the region of Argob. Now, Argob is a really interesting word. I looked this word up in the um, Bi Biblical Encyclopedia, um, I, and it points to Aria, which is Aria, Ari. I don't know exactly how uh, it's pronounced. And this is that's what the Hebrew Dictionary pointed us to. And when you read about that, it says that it's a region east of Jordan, which is in Deuteronomy 3, 4, and 5. It's equivalent to the kingdom of Og and Bashan, and in 313 is referred to as the region of Argob, even all Bashan. When you look up the word Argob in the Strong's Concordance, it'll refer you to the word Aria. And so, interestingly, I found this book called A Visit to Bashan and Argob, and I started finding uh, interesting symbols there. I think you can see that one symbol down there. And the word Aria, it's hard to, it's hard to get around that word Aria and not think... Of a certain civilization and so uh, the Amorites interestingly enough are super associated with Aryans and I found a video by Robert Separ which is a human anthropologist uh, not a believer but um, has a lot of good anthropology information and linguistic information and so I put a video together just kind of editing some of this up and I think you guys will be interested in it it's well worth the time that it, it takes to watch this guy. So check this out. This will, I believe this will blow your mind. I could be wrong. Let me know if it does or not in the chat. To gain a deeper insight into the linguistic history of the ancient Middle East, one must consider events that took place during the beginning of the Bronze Age, when the Middle East, Levant, and Mediterranean were dominated by the Amorites, who would go on to establish Babylon, which was raised from a small town to an independent and influential city-state. Almost all of the local kings in Babylonia, such as Hammurabi, belong to this Amorite stock. In the Bible, they are described as a powerful people of great strength and stature, quote, like the height of the cedars, which led some Christian scholars to refer to the Amorites as giants. In Deuteronomy, the Amorite king, Og was described as the last of the remnant of the Rephaim, an ancient race of giants. Discovered by accident in 1928, Ugrit was an ancient port city in northern Syria, laying in a large artificial mound in the Mediterranean coast, which flourished from around 4,000 years ago until its destruction in 1185 BC. These ancient cuneiform tablets were written in the 13th century BC and inscribed in Uruitic, an otherwise unknown Northwest Semitic language, considered the only existing remnant of the Amorite language. The most famous of the Ugarit texts are approximately 50 epic poems, as well as 150 tablets describing the Ugaritic cult and its magic rituals. The three major literary texts are the Legend of Keret, the Tale of Agat, and the Baal Cycle, also known as the Epic of Baal, which is about the Canaanite god Baal, which means lord or owner, and refers to an ancient storm god associated with sex, rain, and fertility. The text identifies Baal as the god Hadad, introduced to Mesopotamia by the Amorites, where he became known as the Akkadian or Assyrian Babylonian 
god Adad. He appeared bearded, often holding a club or thunderbolt, while wearing a bull-horned headdress, as the sun was in Taurus in the old Babylonian period around the second millennium BC. Hadad was equated with the Hittite storm god Teshub, the Greek god Zeus, and the Roman god Jupiter. In ancient Egypt, he was Amun, which was combined with Ra, the sun, to make Amun-Ra, depicted as a ram during the age of Aries, as any god associated with Jupiter's 12-year orbit along the ecliptic all stem from the ancient Atlantean solar religion of the Pleistocene which kept track of the 25,920-year procession of the equinox. Unique among the Ugarit texts are the earliest known lists of letters in alphabetic cuneiform, the traditional names for the letters of the Phoenician alphabet. Other tablets found in the same location were written in other cuneiform languages, Sumerian, Hurrian, and Akkadian as well as the Egyptian and Luwian hieroglyphs, and Crypto-Minoan, which is the pre-Greek language of ancient Crete. The Amorites are also mentioned in the Bible as inhabitants of Canaan both before and after the conquest of the land under Joshua, meaning the time of Moses and the Exodus, and the term Amuru in Akkadian and Sumerian texts refer to the Amorites, their principal deity, and the Amorite kingdom, known as the land of Amuru, and later as Aram, which is where we get the name of the Mesopotamian language called Aramaic. Aramaic and Hebrew are both Semitic languages, a term that comes from the biblical Sem, the oldest son of Noah, and pertains to a linguistic group, not a race. The term Aryan in modern times is interchangeable with the Indo-European languages, but in antiquity and in mystery school religions describe the ancient nobility of the Holocene, stretching back to before the Bronze Age. The term Aryan was etched in 2,500-year-old cuneiform in Iran by Darius the Great, who claimed that he and his ancestral lineage came from the, quote, Aryan race. Rudolf Steiner also used the term Aryan to describe the Aryans as descendants of the Atlanteans, who went on to establish the early civilizations of the Holocene, which was also mirrored by the American congressman Ignatius Donnelly, who in 1882 authored the book Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. The German Ancestral Research Society, which, except for one member, was found not guilty of any war crimes during the Nuremberg Trials, with every scientist and archaeologist going on to become esteemed professors at universities around the world following World War II. An article published in the peer-reviewed journal Nature Communications claims that blonde-haired, blue-eyed, fair-skinned settlers invaded and inhabited the Levant some 6,500 years ago, according to DNA studies, solving the mystery of how the Chalcolithic culture got to Galilee, which is another way of saying the Copper Age. Quote, Scientists have discovered that waves of migration from Anatolia and the Zagros Mountains to the Levant helped develop the Chalcolithic culture that existed in Israel's Upper Galilee region some 6,500 years ago. Certain genetic characteristics, such as blue eye color, were not seen in the DNA test results of earlier Levantine human remains. While the terms Nordic Aryan and Semitic might seem to be in conflict to some, the Amorites were regarded as nomadic pastoralists, meaning they moved around to let their herds graze, consisting of various domesticated animals, such as horses and cattle. After several millennia, this Middle Eastern or Eurasian demographic that domesticated cattle and drank its milk adapted the ability to drink milk as an adult, meaning they became genetically lactose tolerant and many migrated into Europe. Northern Europeans are among the most lactose tolerant people in the world as their ancestry is descended from Aryan tribes that introduced domesticated horses and cattle into Europe, as well as blue eyes, which during the Holocene 
can be traced to one Eurasian tribe originating around the Caucasus Mountains, where we get the term Caucasian from. In prior videos, I've already discussed how Icelandic sagas, as put forth by Snorri Sturluson, backed by archaeological research performed by Thor Heyerdahl, placed the origins of the Odin story in Eurasia, claiming that the origin of the Norse royal dynasties and pre-Christian Norse gods entered Europe from the Caucasus, emigrating from the Black Sea region through the area or city called Azov, around the river Don into Scandinavia. The ancient Amorite god associated with pastoralism was known in Sumerian as Martu, but the name used by the Amorites was Amuru, developing into a major deity in Babylon. An association between Amuru and the steppes is well attested, as he was also referred to as Lord of the Steppes, but also Lord of the Mountains. Amuru's main attribute was the gamelu, a type of crooked staff used by shepherds, depicted on ancient cylinder seals, as well as depictions of pharaohs and other gods and deities, including Jesus. Amuru's father was the sky god Anu, and the name Amuru could refer to both the god and to the people themselves. In other words, they did not call themselves Canaanites or Phoenicians. They called themselves Amuru, which designated part of Syria and all of Phoenicia and Palestine. Incidentally, similar to the name of the double-headed winged serpent god of Peru called Amaru. So that, it's interesting to me. So... Looking into that, it confirms a lot of what I've found through this, that this could be the possible first starting civilization of where we're getting this term Aryan from. You know, this could be where all of these theosophists and all of these people have this ideology that somehow this Aryan race was considered, um, I don't, I don't really know. It's an interesting theory to me. And obviously uh, people like Hitler and people like that put a lot of, effort and spunk into that david what do you when you hear that what do, what comes to mind well according to this documentation 6500 years ago we see the hexagram and the pentagram and the swastika being used by the amorites in israel long before king david came along and yeah. they tried to attach that uh, the six pointed star with King David. Yeah. Also, the the bullet points just keep hitting. We've got the the two horns. We've got the hammer. We've got all these things that point us to this Aryan Aryan Viking civilization. The Vikings were kind of a expression of this yeah. uh, in a very strong way in the Norse mythology with Thor's hammer there. Yeah. Two horned helmets and the whole thing. They had the whole thing going on there. Yeah, you can pretty much trace this lineage too by this hammer. This this god king is almost always represented with a hammer, also a staff, and and um, it's interesting. And so another thing that got me thinking, David, because of this, is Deuteronomy thirty three twenty two. It says, "End of Dan." He said, "Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan." So, lion. That word lion, airy like Aries, um, it's saying Dan is a whelp, a airy whelp, and a, wh a whelp of the lion, and he shall leap from Bashan. And I don't think it's a coincidence that these two words are posed together in this. What do you think about that, David? Well, absolutely. And um, there's another text, I can't recall the, the location, but it talks about Dan being in ships. And, yeah, yeah and uh yeah and i believe and well also uh the the world today isn't configured geographically like it was uh like before pangea but even after that I, you know when it says that og was the last of the remnant of the rephaim well you go into the uh when Joshua went in, we see him fighting them down in the yeah. area of Gaza. Yeah. But so, you know, what I think it's saying of those there in that, uh, the land of Bashan, they saw they was going to get themselves a big whooping yeah. and they left. And this is why we see 
these uh, things turning up in the eastern United States, South America, even down in our area. Yeah. We can see this down in our area in Indiana, Kentucky, the remains of this uh, this uh, Canaanite slash Amorite civilization right here. Yeah, be, in Joshua 9, it talks about how he uh, le let some of them live. Um, I'm going to pull up Joshua 9 and just read a couple uh, passages here. And it says, And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side of Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys and in the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work willily, wildly, wildly like still, they worked in a way that was cunning, and went and made it as if they had been ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their asses, and wine bottles old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clatter in their feet and old garments. Basically, to make a long story short, they tricked Joshua, making him think that they were from a long ways away, and begged him to you know, show him mercy. He had just killed Gog, or Og, of king of Bashan. He had just, um, and it says in verse 10, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. So they were frightened. They are like, oh my gosh, man, this guy's going to come and wreck all of us. He just destroyed every strong, these big strongholds. And like David said, they did get away, and we'll talk a little bit about that and show that in the scriptures. And I think we've talked about that a little bit before. But this, they, they made a trick. They made it look like they're from way far away. They're donkeys. They got them all dusted up, and they came before them. And then he found out that they're actually in the town that they were that they were actually already in. And he was like, "Man, you guys tricked me." He's like, um, "You know," and he already made that oath before the princes of the congregation. And so they said. Um, he said, "Look, you guys have you guys were tricky here, but you're going to be my slaves from now on. From now on out, you are the slaves of our people, and that's pretty much all there is to it. And they we will show kind of how they continued on through the Bible here in a minute. And so, um, David, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, you know, there it is so impressive when you read about the stature and the power of these giants, how huge they were, and all they did." But they were afraid of the Israel of God. Yeah. I mean, the Israel of God, when they are marching in obedience to the Father, Joshua led them in, and man, they was uh, they was putting them down. Yeah. And they were afraid of them. They knew that they were against a higher spiritual power and against an army that was gonna gonna put them out. And I tell you what, we we don't want to miss the lesson here of what the Israel of God can do when we're obedient unto Him and are marching or fighting the fights he wants us to fight. No doubt about that. And, um, you know, they were supposed to originally kill every single one of them and get rid of all of those people. And this is a, a, a scripture in Numbers 33, 50 through 56. I want to uh, read these to you. I'm, I'll put them up here, too, for those of you who would like to read. For those of you who are just listening, I'll read it. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, and pluck down all their high places. And ye shall dispose the inhabitants of the land, and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families, and to the more you shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer you shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where he his lot falleth. According to the tribes of your fathers you shall inherit. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side, and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I th thought to do unto them. And so, as you can see, this treaty with Joshua um, goes into a period in Judges chapter 6 where it talks about how they're posing a constant threat, the Amorites are to them. And um, at the end of the period of Judges, you have in Samuel where their relationships improve a little bit. 
And then in 2 Samuel, David continues with the treaty uh, that he had with these people in 2 Samuel 12, 21, 2 through 6. And it says, And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them. And Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement that you bless the inheritance of the Lord? And it goes on to say that the Gibeonites basically uh, had seven men that were of the uh, house of Saul I, uh, killed. You know, that's what they're, they're atonement for. So not only did they continue this, they also killed uh, people because Saul broke their uh, covenant that David I guess they, I, I don't really understand this one, David. What do you what do you think about this? Like, because it's, it goes on to say, I'm just going to read the rest. It says, And the Gibeonites said unto him, We have no silver, no gold of Saul, nor of his house. Neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say? What will I do for you? And they answered the king, The man that consumed us and that devised against us that we should be destroyed for remaining in any of the coast of Israel. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us. And I will hang them up to the Lord of Gibeon of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. Now, it did go on to say that he withheld Jonathan's son, which I believe his name was Mephibosheth, uh, from being killed. So does this mean that he offered up seven sons of Saul to be killed by these people? It appears to be the case, and it appears that Saul did not honor the ancient treaty that Joshua had made and, yeah. and they felt betrayed by that and rightly so. Yeah. And, um, seems to be what we got going on there. In first Kings nine 20, I'll pull this up for you guys here. It says, and all the people that were left of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which were not of the children of Israel, their children that were left and after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not able utterly to destroy Upon those did Solomon levy a tribute of bond service unto this day. But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no bondmen, but they were the men of war, and his servants and his princes, and his captains and his rulers of his chariots and his horsemen. So we go on to see that King Solomon still to that time had honored that treaty and allowed them to be his workers, which brings me to um, a thought here. And because we've heard of the story of legends of Solomon and the lesser keys of Solomon that he had the power and the ring that controlled demonic forces and so he was able to build these temples and Solomon built a temple to Moloch and he even had a palace in Belback that was much bigger than the temple that he built to God and the Phoenicians at the time showered him with gifts and the Phoenicians are interesting and, and there's I, I believe we could do a whole show on the Phoenicians but and I believe that's possible that Solomon might have been sort of a god king to these people, um, similar to the kind of king that the Antichrist will be. He's understanding of secrets, um, dark sentences. Interestingly, some of the only people that it talks about understanding dark sentences in the Scripture are Samson. He was able to make these riddles, dark sentences, which is of the tribe of Dan. And then you also have um, this king that's going to come up and understanding dark sentences that's going to be a type of antichrist type figure i believe david you did an entire show about that and i you know being that the god king according to all of these texts um is the one who controls and is the lord of the dead the one who controls the dead the one who has the power to control the dead could this be something that solomon understood and was able to grab hold of and is this something Og understood is this something that because it seems to be associated with this area as well it seems to be that the one who is in control is from this spot what do you think about that david well it's obvious that solomon rejected the worship of the true god the commandments all of the injunctions against idolatry he chose not to be the the holy king of israel that appeared to him, wanted him to be. But instead, he aspired to be a king in the tradition of Og, the king of Bashan, worshiping uh, Moloch and taking on so many pagan wives. And to this day, to the east 
of the, or no, excuse me, to the, on the west side of the Temple Mount, I believe, there's a place that you can still see it on some maps. It's called the Mount of Corruption. And that is the place on the Temple Mount where Solomon built these altars to the pagan deities. And almost all of these pagan wives, it was the tradition to offer up your firstborn child. So certainly that Solomon made a choice. He made a choice to reject to be the holy king of Israel, and indeed, he emulated this style of the pagan kings, and that's what he strived for. Yeah, it's interesting, man, because, you know, they these bloodline Nephilim kings and these, and these grail bloodlines do believe in a Messiah lineage, obviously, and so they would be probably, if they believed King David was a part of their lineage, they would probably believe Solomon to be one of those hero kings because he had more wisdom than any person and it even talks about how the queen of sheba came to test him on his whatever that word is for dark sentences she came to test him to see what dark sentences that he actually knew uh which is interesting to me uh, it just uh, it, it's possible that he was regarded as this and he was able to maintain and get these secrets like so those, some of those stories might actually be true and he wanted uh, he obviously was not out for the honor of the God of Israel. He right. wanted the pagan nations to emulate him. Right. He was the wisest, most powerful king on the earth. And all of these pagan nations emulated him and looked up to him. Yep. And that's obviously what he wanted because that's exactly what he did. That's what he got. So um, we're going to go on to another branch of the Mediterranean Nephilim. I know it's 11 o'clock, but... If it's up to you guys, you guys let me know in the chat, Do should I do a part two or just keep going? And I'm pretty sure you guys are going to tell me to keep going. I could go, we could go four hours and you guys tell us to keep going, but I, I don't think we're going to do that tonight. We're going to go a little bit more. What do you think, David, part two? Well, or? you know that myself and all the little Torah heads, we love it. You know we love it. <laughs> you guys do a little bit, little pre-pounders pound if you want us to keep going, and, and we'll keep going here. So we'll talk about the Anakim because they obviously tie into this. Uh, uh, quite a bit. Anakim, according to um, Numbers thirteen thirty three, and it says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And so we described these giants. They're very tall, and you have this um, Nephilim grail lineage who survived in Gad, Ashdod, and Gaza, and uh, actually, one of these entities would be uh, Goliath. He would be uh, one of these uh, Philistine giants that survived in that area all the way up to the time of David. And um, the the Anakim were no, also the Hebrew word for them, uh, described as long necks. Uh, also, as you will we'll read here in this book, um, they also had these gold necklaces that they had around their necks. And this helps us tie in more of this Nephilim grail lineage. So I'm going to go to these books. And, of course, uh, I've got David's book with me. I left my book at home um, because that's the kind of guy I am sometimes. Thankfully, David had this same exact book. And we're going to go to um, page 13. And I'm going to see if I can find what I was going to read here. So I'm going to read this part here. I, I think that if I just read this paragraph, we should be good. It says, let us return to the porteurs de Torx for a minute. What actually happened to them? And these Torx, they call these things that go around these porteurs de Torx, they call them Torx. These are what they're called. These gold necklaces are mm -hmm. called Torx. And it says, some of them sold westward were items with their signature, signature ring. Uh, it was found in subsequent periods in Central Europe. We will in due course follow this warrior cast and smith westward. Others probably stayed in Canaan. There is in fact a group mentioned in the biblical tr tradition that may refer to these very same people, namely the Anakim, encountered after the exodus by the Israelites in ancient Canaan. They were not only found in Hebron in southern Canaan, but all across the mountainous areas of the land conquered and subdued by the Israelites. The word Anakim is probably derived from a Hebrew root meaning necklace, and it's been suggested by some that the name means long neck or men with necklaces. 
Although at first the meaning may somehow be in agreement with the description of these giants, the second meaning actually makes sense. The early migrants to Canaan were indeed characterized by metal neck rings they wore. This points to the Anakim having belonged to the porters, their torques, the wearers of the neck rings who might have been identified in local tradition with the race of giants. And I, I'm just going to read one more or just a little bit more because this is super interesting. I think this ties in a lot. According to biblical tradition, some Anakim lived in the south at Hebron when the Israelites established themselves in the land after the Exodus. Among these Anakim, also called the children of Anak, were Ahiman, Shashai, and Talmai. The name Shashai is especially interesting to our investigation. Strikingly enough, this was also the name of the Hyksos kings, one of the Hyksos kings who ruled in Avaris over the Nile Delta from 1637 to 1539 BC. Uh, this p appearance of the name among the Hyksos might suggest that the Anakim were also found in the Hyksos. So you, it goes on to talk about other places that this is associated with. And so not only did they survive, but they also seem to take over control over in Egypt. And we have these, these uh, people there uh, as well. And let me, there's another book page I had here that I'm going to read and see if I can find anything. You got anything to add, David, while I look for this? Well, we got a big association also with the, the Gallic people. Uh, it, it came down from what we would call, and this is right from the area of Tartaria. This is right in the area where they had the Caucasus Mountains, where the word Caucasian comes from, and what they call the Gomerian giants that came from the line of Japheth. And they came down uh, right from that area of Tartaria, down into Asia Minor, and they became, uh, they basically became the Gallic people who went on to become the Druids. And in the Gallic Wars, Caesar would talk about the, the call of, they were the tallest people in the world. And they would about, he specifically talked about the necklaces uh, that they wore. So there's a, just a big identifying factor here with that, uh, that tort necklace is one of these spiritual signatures of this bloodline and this people. I think so too, and the Ugala were the the second class of Nephilim that these Anakim were actually associated with was the Ugala. So that makes a ton of sense. And some of the stuff you're going to see here in a second will even confirm what you're saying uh, one hundred percent more. There's one more thing I was going to read here on page fifty nine, if I can find it here. The Roman broadsword brought him down. Caesar taught his troops to when they come in on the horses to just chop the legs of the soldiers and the horses because it's too big to beat them any other way. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, okay, here I'm just going to read this here. Um, what's, what is striking about the Hurrian is their intimate connection with traditions about the giants. We will, in fact, discover that no other people from this earlier period were so, so closely linked to the giants than the Hurrians, and he connects the Hurrians to the Anakim as well. And um, among the participants in this Tower Rick cult, we find a certain figure who is depicted in a strikingly similar way to the goddess herself. This is the Lion Man. The Lion Man is shown in exactly the same posture as the goddess, exhibiting the very same characteristics, especially those showing her as a terrifying figure, in her fierce vigor to protect those she cares about. Terawet even took the form of the most dangerous of demons when observing her in iconographic depictions with a protruding tongue or with snakes coming out of her mouth. She, in fact, comes very close to being a demonic figure herself. The lion men seem to have represented this dangerous aspect of the goddess. And this lion uh, is, if you guys watch the one we did about in the Mesopotamia and this there was this bird at the top of this tree that had a lion face, but it had like a phoenix type body. Uh, the shaman would often dress these, these, um, um, not trolls, but, um, dwarf Kings. They would often dress in these headdresses and they were vicious warriors that went out. And when we think of dwarves, we think of small beings, but these were considered mighty warriors. Uh, and they would go and they would be, uh, you hear about the lion men of Moab and you have these depictions all through the Mediterranean too of these lion men type tribes depicted in there, which I thought was super interesting and also connected to the Anakim in that as well. What do you know about lion men, David? Well, it's right in the Bible, the lion men of Moab. And we see these creatures and 
there's um, just a lot, you know, all of the traditions of the chimeric peoples, the half human, half animal, and uh, this is all over the architecture. The book of the, the book of Jasher confirms the pollution and the intermixing, not only of the uh, human genome, but of the animal and the the intermingling of the two. Yeah, and it's right there in her Bible, the lion men of Moab. Exactly. And so I'm going to show just to kind of confirm a little bit more about what you're saying about the torques. These are um, some of these are very are Celtic. And then also the Gaul. This is the statue that's on the right hand side, kind of in the middle of the one with the statue with the torque all around the neck and the serpent and the, the, the deer head. The one to the left of it is a Gallic priest or a Gali. Uh, as well with this torque around the neck and these other ones are Celtic in nature and you even have the one-eyed one here uh, to signify I, I'm not sure what that signifies but I think we, we we've probably seen enough to kind of give a understanding of what these things are and so in the Ugaritic, Ugaritic text I, I picked up on something here and this is what I think is a eulogy to Nicomadu the third and I know I'm not I'm not pronouncing that right but this is um, an excerpt from that I'm going to read that mentions these Didanu and the account the, I'm just going to read it. it says the account of the sacred celebration before Zalmu a god have you called the Rephaim of the earth have you summoned the gathering Didanu he called the U Yulkanu and the Rapu he called the Tamramu and the Rapu. He called Sidanu and Redanu. He called the Theralum, and he called the ancient Raphaim. And it goes on to talk about the Dedanu and, and summing them together. And it even goes on to talk about how they would pour their drinks out to these these entities, what they would call Shining Ones or Dedanu. Um, and that certainly rings a bell in Celtic mythology that I'll talk about. But um, I thought that was super interesting. I really didn't realize until I read that, that that they were actually mentioned so heavily within this culture. Yeah, they're all they're all the same uh, uh, stock. And when you see there, you had on the slide there the 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 Gali with the torque and the Celts with the torque. The they're the same people when the when the the Celtic people, when the uh, the Gallic people, when they went to England, they became to be called the the Celts and the Druids. So same people, same people. Yeah, most definitely. So I wanted to. I played this video in um, a show that I did about the tribe of Dan because I thought it was interesting because a lot of this stuff ties in with this. I think I titled it like Blue Bloods or the ancient tribe of Dan or something along those lines. But this. Um, is in reference to what we're talking about exactly here. King Og um, and these Rephaim kings, these these um, Ugalic, Ugal um, entities that were considered Rephaim, I believe that when we're talking about the Tuatha de Danan, that we are actually talking about these forms of Rephaim. And I think when you see this um, video by Irish History Academy and see their... Um, depictions of the Tuatha de Danan, then you might see what I'm seeing here. So let's check this out. The principal figures of the Tuatha de Danan established their otherworldly palaces, or brew, within prominent mounds, many of which still exist to this day. Some of the key characters make appearances as gods and goddesses in both the Ulster and Fenian cycles, sometimes taking the form of a divine parent or appearing to lend guidance or support to a warrior in need. But it's important to note that they are not worshipped as gods and goddesses in a religious sense in the other cycles. In some cases, human remains have even been found inside the passages of these mounds, leading archaeologists to interpret them as burial mounds, passage tombs, or tumuli. Sometimes they are called fairy forts, and they were known as she in the native tongue. The people who lived there were the ace she, or dina she, that is, the people of the Shi or the people of the hills. And while we see here that the people sometimes called them Ondini Maha or the good people, this was done so out of fear of the fairies in case the fairies might be listening and not because they were thought to be actually benevolent. 
In some accounts, it is portrayed that Tatua Hadadanan, the fairies, hate the men of Ireland for having driven them out of their worldly kingdom into the hills, which draws a parallel with the fallen angels of the Bible and the jinn of Islam. Mounds and tulloks were believed to be fairy forts and are still called so to this day. These were the otherworldly and magical domains of the fairies. Strange things are said to happen around them. Animals would not approach them, for example, and people dare not enter near them, and farmers dare not level them because of the fear of the wrath of the she dwelling inside. Perhaps the most well known of the she is that infamous Gaelic omen, the Banshee, which literally means the woman she, or woman person of the hills, a woman fairy. Her wailing scream is said to be a portent of death to those who hear it but traditionally she visits only certain Gaelic families. Following the logic of the word Banshee, expert in Celticology and mythology, Peter Beresford Ellis has speculated that the word fairy may derive from far she, which would mean a man she, or a man person of the hills, or a man fairy, a fair she, or a fairy, fairy. Incidentally, he considers that the word pixie could similarly derive from a reference to the Picts, a mysterious pre scotic race inhabited in North Britain who could be Pictsies or Pixies. Regardless of what we think of all this, the fairies, which are the minimised descendants of the Tuatha Dé Danann, were thought to be real, and this had a significant influence on the beliefs and therefore the actions of the people who held to the superstitions. So that kind of just ties in that. And obviously, you know, a lot of people don't understand the connection that is all over the world. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But, man, it's it's amazing to kind of see this tradition. And this doesn't talk about it, but in Irish mythology and even in, in uh, America, they all, they're, you know, the, the idea of pour one out for your the dead homies, pour one out for them. This goes back all the way back to this ancient Mediterranean practice of, worshiping or basically giving gifts to the dead do you have anything you wanted to add to that david before i move on here no it 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 sure does and this whole worship and the understanding of these little fairy houses there are people that uh, claim to see these and this is so prevalent in scandinavia norway and iceland people are all about it we were talking a couple rides ago about a construction job that the, the workers wouldn't go in there because there were li- these little mounds that they believed to be fairy homes in there yeah they wouldn't go yeah and it's and you know a lot of these what we consider we hear about fairies people think because of companies like disney you think of these little twinkly beans that you know like on peter pan or something uh, and i can't think of any other shows that have little fairies like that but i know that they're riddled in disney riddles with them in all the movies but ultimately where these words come from um have a much deeper meaning and a much deeper significance than what people realize because i think people don't understand that demons are in fact real in this world and that there are bloodlines still to this day that truly believe that they are inheritors of these ancestral spirits and um, in, in as presidents of the United States, even they have this ritual called the raising of Osiris. They, um, the apotheosis of our first president, George Washington, was done in Washington, D.C. You can trace these bloodlines. One more interesting fact before I move on to that Og, uh, his literal interpretation means long neck, which could have a lot to do too with the translation of these Anakim as having long necks because Og. His name itself actually meant that. Um, not 100% sure, but I thought it would be interesting. Also, interestingly, this um, map here, this shows the uh, territory conquered by David. And it shows that the Phoenicians and the Philistines, and the, they always kind of have had, still to this day, there's a hold on those properties. And they, they, Israel has never been able to consume those properties. And I think a lot of that must have to do with um, these Nephilim contracts that were made long, long ago. What do you think about that, David? Well, um, I know it's written in Scripture that 
uh, Israel did possess all the land that was promised, but there were these definite groups of peoples that they didn't drive out, and they became a snare to them. Yeah. But it definitely under Israel, uh, under David, uh, they they fulfilled the promise in Genesis 15. There's about three or four scriptures you can definitively see that they did possess all the land that was promised in the original land promise. Right, and but uh, but for some reason, um, they never fully subdued all of these. I mean, they feel subdued them at one time, but they never have been able to get those back. And I think, and I have to say yeah, that um, I, I have to say that a lot of that has ha, that has to be um, maybe not the people that live it, but somebody who claims title on that land. What do you think? Yeah, we were talking our, on our uh, ride on Baalbek, how that we read the scripture from Joshua where they, they defeated them and there was a great slaughter, but they didn't drive them out. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, there you go. Yeah. It said they would be like thorns in their eyes yeah, and, yeah, and thorns sure in their yeah. side. And, 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 and you, as you can see, this world is kind of a result of that. When we look at uh, the world that we're living in, there are those who burden the ground. They burden the world. They burden the earth. They burden the people around them. And they um, want to exact full dominating control, just as this ancient order did as well. And um, I'm going to play a little bit more of this video uh, from Robert Sapar. And I wanted you guys to see the American tie to where we live and to American tie to the Amorites and to yeah. this, these uh, grill civilizations. Amuru's father was the sky god Anu, and the name Amuru could refer to both the god and to the people themselves. In other words, they did not call themselves Canaanites or Phoenicians. They called themselves Amuru which designated part of Syria and all of Phoenicia and Palestine. Incidentally, similar to the name of the double-headed winged serpent god of Peru called Amaru, and their territory was known as Amaruka. Speaking of America, just how did it get that name anyway? Officially, America is named after the explorer Amerigo Vespucci. But this appears doubtful, like so much of American history, which has transformed a one-time pirate of the family name Griego into an iconic hero named Christopher Columbus. As for America, according to Manley Hall, America is named after the plumed serpent, who is the messenger of the sun. He was the god Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, and in Peru he was called Amaru, from the latter name comes our word America. Amaruka is literally translated land of the plumed serpent. As this plumed serpent was a messenger of the sun, he was also a light bearer. We are told that the new world symbols have nothing to do with the same symbolism revered in the old world and that there was no transatlantic contact before Columbus. But looking at a map of haplogroup X, which stretches back into the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, we could see a strong, direct link between the New World and, in particular, Phoenicia, or Amuru. This genetic link is reinforced when one considers the Mesoamerican legends of giants, bearded Caucasian inhabitants, Solutrean stone tool technology, and parallels in mythology. I've discussed in prior videos that the large ancient mining operations in Michigan produced huge quantities of copper, which could not be accounted for in known Native American artifacts, implying that it was used to fuel the Bronze Age in the old world by the Phoenician transatlantic merchants. That said, copper was not the only metal brought back to the Levant from the Americas, but also large quantities of gold were also hoarded and buried in Jerusalem, giving rise to the legends of Solomon's gold and part of the treasures that inspired the Templar Crusades into the Holy Land to retrieve the vast treasure. 
According to the Bible, King Solomon received a cargo every three years, which consisted of gold, silver, and other valuables from Ophir, which was famous for its wealth. The theologian Benito Arias Montano in 1571 proposed finding Ophir in the name of Peru, reasoning that the native Peruvians were thus descendants of Ophir and Shem. This is a map of Montano's Sacra Geographia, available in the Department of Rare Books and Special Collections at the Princeton University Library, showing the distribution of the descendants of the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In the key at the bottom left, you will notice a red arrow pointing to the word Ophir next to the number 19. There's another red arrow above it pointing at the number 19 in what is modern-day Peru, signifying the location of Ophir. This knowledge was known to the Templars. It is common knowledge in secret society organizations that the Knights Templar were custodians of the ancient secrets of Mesopotamia, as attested to by the archaeologists of the German Ananarabe, which pursued the occult legacy of their perceived noble ancestors all over the world, which may have also included some famous American historical figures as well. A surprise discovery. A time capsule found last week buried more than 130 years beneath the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee was opened in Richmond, Virginia. It wasn't that it wasn't meant to be found. It wasn't meant to be found easily. Crews uncovered it while working to remove the pedestal where the Lee statue, long seen as a symbol of racial injustice, had stood until its removal in September. It was taken down following protests over racism and police brutality. Inside the capsule were three books, including an almanac from 1875, a cloth envelope, a pamphlet, and a silver coin. I think it's part of the mystery of maybe the lost cause. What were they thinking back then? Records from the Library of Virginia indicated around 60 items would be found inside, and a newspaper article from that time period suggested the capsule contained Civil War artifacts and a picture of Lincoln lying in his coffin. Instead, just those six items and the three books appear to have suffered severe water damage. There were no open by dates uh, prior to the 1920s, 1930s. They put these time capsules in with the ex expectation that they would last in perpetuity. So it's, it's like, well, why would they do that? Virginia Governor Ralph Northam says it's an important day for the history of Richmond and Virginia, and that the books will shed light on what people were thinking in the late 19th century. While the mainstream media made the find seem mundane, I did happen to catch a segment as part of a two-hour PBS special of the unpacking and would like to show you some of the buried contents which CBS News failed to mention. Um, I think we're just gonna... I don't know what I'm looking at yet. Um, I can't... I'm not sure what it is. I think it's bored with some kind of metal on it. There's one more shot I didn't give. I should have been Cindy Bailey, who's the governor's council here. Jessica Colleen, who is here. If you all remember, uh, taking down this monument was not without its legal challenges. And Rita Davis, who was Cindy's predecessor, uh, kind of led the way to it's make this. It's a piece of card, I think. It's two pieces of card. Okay, well, this is a 
I'd love to get my hands on that list. What do you think about that, David? Oh, that's fascinating. That is just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's um, what people don't say sometimes speaks much louder than what they do. And for those of you that couldn't see that or you're you're just listening to that, this is um, they uncovered this time capsule underneath a statue of Robert E. Lee back when they were taking down statues. And in this time capsule, there was uh, what we were looking at here was an envelope and it had some sort of um, black, of course it looked black at the time, but a like a cross of sorts, like a Templar cross or a Knight's cross. And inside of it, it was uh, talking about the Knight's Templar and, and showing a list of the commanders. And um, were you familiar with that unit, David? No, um, and um, it, it's hard to tell with just no more than we had to look at there, but uh, there were many degrees in Freemasonry and in the higher degrees in the Scottish and the York that you that recognize themselves as the continuation of the Knights Templar. Yeah. So that is just deeply, deeply fascinating. Yeah, and it, it just brings more light to these stories of these uh, seven Atlanteans that traveled the world teaching people laws, teaching them how to mine, teaching them how to build things and create civilizations, and then uh, playing this long game of eventually coming back to these uh, locations to collect gold and end up possibly, if this Peru is in fact Ophir, the Phoenicians probably possibly traveled all the way to Ophir to bring back gold to Solomon. Um, and that interesting, it's an interesting number of uh, gold that they had to bring. What it was it, 666 uh, yeah. talents yeah. or something? Yeah. There are also people that make a case for the copper mines of Solomon being in eastern Kentucky and Michigan. Yeah. And it's interesting, too. We did a midnight ride not very long ago about peru being the place where out of these caves are coming these face peelers yeah so there's just a lot of a lot of this makes a lot of sense in a lot of different directions yeah and man i, I just it's exciting so i do want to read something because there's a lot of people thinking man like i i fit into some of these nephilim uh bloodlines but i i would say that most likely and just this is just my thoughts but most likely the rulers of the people were the nephilim um, civilization. Some of these um, kingdoms, such as the Amorites, would have been a uh, lineage of Cain, uh, which would have been the third son, I believe, of Ham. And because they're mentioned in Genesis 10, 10 in the nations, but something happened. Something they got a hold of something toxic and something went south. But what I will say is this that God, whether you are um, of the lineage of the Nephilim or not, uh, I want to read something to you guys because I think that um, it holds true for most of us. I know I'm European uh, probably mostly. David's European mo probably mostly, and a lot of people listening. And a lot of us have lineage things that are, are difficult in our lineage. But in Exodus, uh, or not Exodus, Ezekiel 16, I'm going to pull it up here. I've got, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it is a very long chapter, but I do suggest all of you that are listening to this, when we get done here, read it. It's really interesting. But the first two or, th or verse two and three of this says, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is in the land of Canaan, and thy father was an Amorite and thy mother was a Hittite. And if you go on to read this chapter, you will see that Jerusalem is tasked with or, or is tried with committing some of the worst abominations, with mixing with every tribe that was around them, whoring themselves out to different things, uh, worshiping other gods, allowing their children to pass through fire, committing fornication with the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Philistines, you name it. They did it all to a point to where they were um, completely just hoard out to be the best word for it but then at the end of this chapter this is what god says here and it says nevertheless in verse 60 i will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth and i will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant 
Then thou shalt remember thy ways, and be ashamed when thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder, and thy younger. And I will give them unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant. And I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open the mouth any more because of thy shame, when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord. And this is specifically referring to Jerusalem in this um, this here being mixed with all of this. It's interesting because obviously Jerusalem was a city before uh, before there was ever Israelites. And so you have this kind of, I wouldn't say cryptic, but interestingly similar scenario that what we see in, in uh, Revelation with the whore of Babylon, you know, whoring herself out to many nations. And, um, and then in the end it says these other nations um, like Sodom, etc. Um, they were even the Philistines were even ashamed by the actions. And David, you're pulling something up here. Well, it brings to mind the scripture in Titus three and five. Um, when we're brought again, you know, people, a lot of people worry about Rh negative blood. We worry about, um, you know, we've all got. I guarantee you some uh, shady ancestors. But Titus three and five not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the holy ghost literally washing and regening you the the lord will clean up your genetics he'll take care of that genetic iniquity um we don't uh have to worry about where we came from we just have to worry about where we're going i agree man it's so it's so important and thank we're so thankful to the messiah who came to actually die for our sins not to be like the bad shepherd that it speaks of which i fully believe this bad shepherd they're talking about is of this evil lineage but this we have the good shepherd the one who looks after the sheep the one who dies for the sheep the one who regenerates us and and moves us forward and i'm so thankful for that i know that you know just in my own bloodline there's a lot of a lot of these type people in my bloodline and david probably being a sicilian bloodline you have that as well and many of the listeners out there are going to if you look back far enough you're going to find something you may not have wanted to find you bet you will yeah you bet you will so with that being said guys i just want to say thank you for listening if you enjoyed this um i i, I want to say this today because this is coming up this eclipse is coming up repent i say this every day but repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand uh the time of the kingdom will come it'll come like this and most people will not be ready so make sure you're ready humble yourself before god humble yourself before others and love each other and continue to walk in the mercies of god and um subscribe if you like this and david um you got anything to add before we end this out i tell you what you know you like it. I loved it. I really, really, I was taking all kinds of notes. It's just a really, really good job, John. And it's time for that Pounder's Pound. This it, gives us a little booth in the algae rhythms, and you know we need all the help we can get. <laughs> no doubt. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. One. One two, two. Three. three. Boom. Boom. Man, I felt that one all the way over here, guys. And I know a lot of you already hit the like button earlier because you wanted us to continue. So thank you so much. We appreciate you guys. We couldn't do what we do without you. We are so blessed to just, just to be able to do this in these times because we know that the times of wisdom is going to be cut off soon enough, and we're thankful to be able to be a voice in the wilderness. And so, David, end us out. I believe now is a good time to enter into our prayer closets and watch and pray and be ready for whatever comes to pass. And uh, we just know that uh, with the Lord, we have nothing to fear. We just need to be wise and be ready, prayed up, and ready to be obedient to whatever the Father would have us to do. And, and with that, we're just thankful again for another midnight ride every time we have the opportunity to preach the gospel and to bring forth truth on this platform. We thank the Lord Most High for it and also all of you, the Midnight Ride audience. And with that, until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride.
and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.